This is Beekeeper Confidential, a show about the curious lives of bees and their beekeepers. I'm your host, Mandy Shaw. Today's interview was weeks, maybe months in the making. This is the first time that I've interviewed somebody from overseas, and it took some extra effort to make it happen, but I'm so glad that it did. I think you'll be as charmed as I was to meet today's guest. He's one of the early producers of the New York City Honey Week. He was key organizer for the 2018 Learning from the Bees Conference, and he continues to develop his Ambisador program, which is a collective of bee ambassadors who work to unite scientists, beekeepers, activists, enthusiasts, and their communities. Joining us from his home in Berlin, please put your Nasnov glands up and welcome Steve Rogenstein to our hive. Good morning. Well, I guess, good evening? It's six. Okay. So. <laughs> well, here we are. Tell me. Third time's a charm. Is it the third? This is the third time we've tried. Well, that's embarrassing. It's, well, <laughs> I'm just really proud that we've made it here. <laughs> <laughs> we've had our technical challenges, but here we are. Um, oh, that's right. We tried that once. Yes. And then the second then, time, the time change goofed us up. Oh, you're right. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, it's good to meet you sort of in person. Likewise. And you're based up in Oregon. Yeah. I'm, um, I'm in Beaverton, which is about eight miles west of Portland. Okay. I don't really know my... Oregon geography very well. <laughs> I know Laura B is in talent. Yeah, in so she Ashland, is. And that's they're down, like four right? hours straight south from here. Okay. Um, yeah, the interstate is. It makes it really easy to drive down there because it's just a straight shot. Right. So yeah, she's about four hours south. Cool. Yeah, and you are in Spain. I moved. I'm in Berlin now. Oh, okay. Tell me about Berlin. Berlin is the capital of Germany. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have you the latitude separated? and longitude? <laughs> well, let's see. It's still dark out at 7 a.m. And the sun starts setting at about, I don't know, before 4 o'clock. Mm. So, and everybody keeps saying, oh, my God, it must be so cold. But it's about... I don't know, it hovers around 35 or so, but it's it hasn't snowed. Well, I saw a snowflake or two a couple okay. of days ago. Okay. Um, but it's it's really kind of mild right now. And I'm a cold person normally, so the fact that I can go out with one pair of socks and you know, not gloves is a good thing. <laughs> that Although is after good. living in Spain for five years, I really, really didn't. I didn't realize that I missed the season so much and it's nice to have a fall and it's nice to have a winter and, mm. and we're in a temperate zone. So we have all the foliage. We have the beech trees that turn bright yellow and the maples that turn red. And I really miss all that because I'm an East coaster and, you know, I took that for granted. Mm -hmm. Where on the East coast are you from? New York. Okay. Wow. So what brought you to Europe? It's a long story. <laughs> I won't go into too many details. Uh, but a series of events, my relationship ended. My mother sold our house up in the mountains, which kept my sanity in New York. Wow. My rent was going up another 25%. Uh, I lived in an enormous loft that doubled as kind of an underground art space slash nightclub. Cool. And we had incidents with the police, oh. which kind of shut us down. So without that operating anymore and with my rent going up, it was just this culmination of 
circumstances that led me to think, okay, what's my next step? Do I move into a postage size apartment paying two and three thousand dollars a month? Do I move to Europe and learn a second language and live abroad finally? And I realized that you know I didn't want to be on my deathbed regretting that I had never jumped into that kind of adventure. And I did it. And now it's five plus years later and I had no idea. And my, my, I said two years minimum and now it's five years later. And now I'm in my second country. Wow, so. that is such an incredible story. I always think about this and I think it's because when I was 18 and 19 years old, I worked in um, elder care, like assisted living, end of life services. And from then on, like I, I never want to die having regrets about not having had adventures. Yeah. And, and the first thing that I had done was started my own company. And that wasn't as successful as I had hoped. But mm -hmm. the fact that it wasn't enabled me to come here, which was another one of these lifelong aspirations and dreams. I remember being like 10 years old. No, I was probably younger than that. I was probably, yeah, I was probably like eight or so. And my cousin, who's 14 or 16 years older, was studying abroad in Spain. And I remember, I want to go to Spain. I want to live in Spain. <laughs> and sure enough, how many 20 something, 30 years later, I lived in Spain. And it was always this kind of like kernel of a seed that had just been planted that never really materialized. Mm -hmm. And actually, prior to all this, I worked at an international company, uh, a small design firm that had offices in Madrid and Barcelona and Santiago in Chile, uh, Brussels and New York. And I was traveling back and forth pretty regularly to Spain and, and Brussels. And they ultimately teased me with a job in Spain. And I agreed. And then when we started talking about the details, they rescinded and it never happened, didn't materialize. Oh. However, again, that seed was planted. And I think it was three years later I moved. So when did bees show up? So bees came into my life. Let's see. I mean, the, the, the long story is that when I was like 12 years old, we were in social studies class. And our teacher was sick and the substitute teacher was like ancient. I mean, I, I, at this point, I'm thinking he was like 80, but perhaps he was 50. I don't know. But <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, he was talking about World War II. So, I mean, this is probably in the 80, early 80s. So he must, have been, he must have been old. And the class was not paying attention whatsoever. There were like jokes and notes being passed and all that. And so he kind of, I guess thought that if he were to talk about something that was of personal interest and passion, perhaps he could control the crowd mm -hmm. or the, the class. And so he started talking about beekeeping. And with that, the class erupted into pure chaos. There were <laughs> spitballs and kids out of their seats. And he just, he could not control us whatsoever. And there I was, total nerd, in the front row, you know, like cradle, <laughs> chin, mouth agape, wonderment in my eyes thinking you keep bees as pets like you can do that and here's another seed that got planted and I dabbled with bees a couple of times in the early 90s when I had moved into New York City I tried to volunteer as a beekeeper or an assistant or an apprentice or something this is pre-internet, pre-email, and I remember looking in the phone book for community gardens and started wow. calling them up and asking if they knew where there were bees. And there's one person in a garden nearby where I lived said, yeah, come down. I got suited up. We climbed up onto a shed. We opened up the hive, peered inside. And I said, I will do whatever it takes to help you. This is fascinating. Never got the return call. Oh. And I remember there were like three other gardens that I had identified that had bees. And I tried and they never called back. I don't know why. Wow. And it's funny because now I know 
so many beekeepers who would be, you know, like clamoring for help. Yeah. For somebody to come out of the woodwork to call and say, hey, I'm interested. But it never took root. And then I remember I took a class about composting in the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. And I remember that they talked about bees there in that class. And I it got the bug again. And we had had a house up in the mountains, about two and a half hours outside of the city. And I started exploring beekeeping groups up there, but they were meeting on Tuesdays and we were only weekenders. So I couldn't, I couldn't take Monday and Tuesday off of work and then find some way to get back into the city for work on Wednesday. So that never happened. And then a friend bought a house down the street and I said, I'd love to install bees on your property. And he said, yes, but that never happened. And then a friend of mine, this is several years later, said, yeah, I'm, I'm signed up for unlimited classes at this community arts center place that had everything from woodworking to jewelry making to uh, a sound studio to television stuff, all these things. He said, I'm taking a beekeeping class. I literally interrupted him, said, I got to go, hung up, registered. <laughs> and I think it was like two weeks later. And that was it. Our teacher was leading a course with the Brooklyn Grange, which was like a nine month apprenticeship. And I said, I need to get into this. And she's like, I'm sorry, it already started. I badgered her to be in the program the following year. <laughs> in that subsequent year, I bought as many books as I could find, read everything I could get my hands on. I signed up for another course. I took another class and that was it, I was hooked. And then I got into the Brooklyn Grange's uh, beekeeping apprenticeship program, which was nine months. I signed us up for the pilot program of the Bee Informed Partnership. Wow. Yeah. I'm talking and, with them tomorrow. Oh my God, that's so funny. <laughs> I just had a conversation with one of the research uh, directors and mentioned to her because I had met a couple of the, the reps at Apimonia in Montreal and said to them, hey, I think that I was part of your program, but on the website, you say that you started in, I don't know, I'm gonna make this up, like 2014, and I was in it in 2012. And they're like, well, we don't really know, but it turns out it was a pilot program. So- oh, That's so cool. We were, yeah, <laughs> and, 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 I, and I loved participating because for me, it was to learn more about the health of bees and the incidence of varroa and nosema i think were the two that they were tracking at that point mm -hmm. and to be in a pilot program with i think eight other institutions across the country was pretty cool and you know what we needed to do was of our 40 hives collect samples of bees about 300 bees per month from eight of our hives and some <laughs> of some of our participants had ethical issues against this I did not enjoy doing it at all, but I figured, hey, 300 bees, that's like one day's, one, one fifth of one day's laying of eggs. Yeah. They're going to die anyway. Right. For us to be sacrificing them for science, I don't like this at all, but oof, I guess... This, I, is, this is for the for the benefit of the species. So yeah. it's kind of like in natural uh, or Darwinian beekeeping. If you've got a hive that's you know succumbed to varroa, instead of you know manipulating it and trying to you know split blah blah blah, let it die off. It's better for the superorganism, superorganism. You know the superorganism of the species and not the colony. Yeah. So I justified it. I probably would not participate now because I've evolved in beekeeping. <laughs> right. But back then, I was committed. I participated this year with one oh, of my cool. apiaries, and it's still the same looking for varroa levels and nosema. Uh, but that testing was so rigorous. Um, but that was something that I really got out of it because it got me in that habit of doing the testing and I've been able to show beekeepers here how to test mm -hmm. and I just tell them because there is a lot of um, there's a lot of emotion tied up in well I love my bees why am I gonna kill 300 there's so many 
but I just think of it as a blood draw. Yeah. You know, like if you were sick or if you were checking for an illness, would you want to have a test done to see or would you rather just wait it out and wait for symptoms when it's too late to, you know? <laughs> That's a good analogy. And I mean, we were doing eight hives. So I only did four. <laughs> I didn't yeah, want to sign up for 2, eight. <laughs> 2,400, yeah, 2,400 bees every oh, month. It was, oh, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I, I had literally, there were two people in our group that she couldn't even be around it. She's like, I'm leaving. And I'm like, I completely respect you. And I hope you don't hate me. But, yeah. you know, we, we decided as a group to participate. So there was consensus. And then from there, it just snowballed. I asked the Brook and Grange how I could be more involved. They had launched two years prior the New York City Honey Fest. So with the production background of events, I jumped aboard and me and a partner who was volunteering as a farmer on the Grange who had event experience as well. We partnered to organize it that year in 2013. And it was so successful for both of us that we expanded it into New York City Honey Week the following year with 35 events in a week in four of the five boroughs. And wow. it, was, it was awesome. It was You're awesome. You're ambitious. <laughs> always. <laughs> always, always. And, and now it's, let's see, in 2020, it'll be going into its 10th year. So oh my it's, we, we, she and I pretty much gave it its foundation, like organized it from a, a very kind of logistical and kind of visionary perspective, such uh -huh. as this is what you send to sponsors. This is what you send to the press. This is what you do to the participants. So we established kind of the templates and the, the you know, production infrastructure. And I think it, it gained its legs from that point on. Which what an is, amazing legacy. Well, I didn't found it. I just, I <laughs> but just to be pushed such, it along. such an important part of the logistical aspects of it. And like, I, I find it's hard to find people that are willing to devote energy into these types of things because it, oh, yes. it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have had experiences since then. Yeah. Um, and then moving to Barcelona and finding out that they don't have urban beekeeping, that it's illegal, I wanted to stay connected to the bees. So I, I kind of realized it was illegal there. Yeah. Weird. Uh, Why? So <clears throat> they're averse to change and it's been on the books for something like a hundred years. And, and it's kind of like New York City that the bees got lumped in with other animals. And whereas in New York, it's exotic and what did they call it exotic and dangerous no they, they, they had a better word making it more kind of you know kind of nefarious really flashy but, um, wow in catalonia specifically they were lumped in with other animals more kind of like husbandry in the city yeah so yeah, you can have cows and here. sheep and things like this because you know the city was growing exponentially probably at that point and it was a issue of hygiene and you know sanitary conditions in the city you couldn't have manure and you know cows and sheep and we bleeding. don't want bee poo on all the vehicles and buildings i don't think they think about that but <laughs> but then of course there's the fear and you know in spain and portugal there's the iberian subspecies which is more defensive than you know let's say your italians or carniolans and it's a little challenging to have those bees. Uh, you know, whereas in New York, I would only wear a veil yeah. and sometimes gloves. But in, in Spain, you need to be fully suited with your pant legs tucked in and like cuffs uh, uh, or, or rubber bands around your cuffs. And yeah, they're, wow. they're so they're more like, I guess, Africanized bees. Uh, similar i i i don't know the migratory pattern if the those bees ever got into spain but it's it's rough and tough terrain i mean there's desert and there's you know the the conditions of the mediterranean and you know they're they're they're, they're different species or subspecies uh i mean 
there was one incidence where I got stung 43 times and that's all that I could count. And it was just wow. it was brutal. It Please was brutal. tell me about that. Oh, well, <laughs> I was going on a month long uh, road trip and I had to check the bees before I left. And I was managing an apiary in a vineyard. And um, I went on probably the hottest day of the year. It was like 40 degrees, which translates to about 100 and something. And stupidly, I didn't get there at the crack of dawn. So some of the hives were in full sun at the time that I was inspecting them. They hadn't enough food, so they were hangry. Uh -huh. is what I love to say. <laughs> it's fully the, the, the use, proper use of the word. So they were a little hungry. They were very angry. And here I came in, breaking their seals, invading their space. And I knew that I had two hives in particular that had shown this kind of very defensive behavior. And I must have had four or five of these hives. And they just kept stinging me. And I had taken off all my basically clothes and just put on my on my skin. So it was sticking to my back. So it didn't have poofs of air to protect me from stings. Oh, they were zapping me straight through the fabric right into my flesh. Oh. And, and I had to persist. I couldn't come back later. I was leaving in like a day or two. And I mean... <laughs> It's just screaming at them. I'm here to help you. <laughs> I'm your friend. But, you know, they, 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 they just kept stinging me. <clears throat> so I actually, I, I'm, I'm not allergic to bees. But that is so much venom. It's a lot of venom. But I, I took a Benadryl just in case. And then I had to drive home an hour. And then we were getting ready to drive like six hours in a day or two. I'm like, I can't get like sick or anything with it. But anyway, I got home and I took all my clothes off and I looked in the mirror to see how, my, how many stings I had received. And I had noticed, and this is where we get into the kind of what is the magic of the bees and what's their spiritual connection to the planet. But at that point, I was in rehabilitation for a frozen shoulder and I was going to physical therapy and I had just had my last session the day before. And I kept thinking to myself, I'm going to be on the road for a month. I have to do my exercises every single day. I can't neglect this. I need the mobility of my shoulder back. And I counted, I must have had like 15 or 18 stings on that injured shoulder. And basically they were saying, we'll give you a dose of medicine here and you'll take the 26 other stings on your body because, you know, bittersweet, you get the honey and the sting, you get the medicine and you get the sting. And, you know, I always say that when I get stung, it's a gift from the bees because it's just pure medicine. Mm -hmm. And I just, I took that as their kind of sign to me and their, I don't know, appreciation for me or, you know, just kind of a little whatever. tough love. Whatever it was, I was I was I expressed gratitude for it because my shoulder got better. Wow. Yeah. Incredible. I I'm trying to be more appreciative of when I get stung. Like this year I was a lot more brave with not having my suit on all the time and I did get a lot more stings, but I'm not quite there yet where I can be like grateful and accepting it as medicine. I, I've heard, and I need to do more research to find out where this comes from, but I've heard that of all the laborial uh, jobs that beekeepers have the lowest incidence of cancer. And, you know, I follow apotherapy blogs and other kind of listservs, and I, I'm very attuned to these medicinal properties of the bees, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't doubt it. So this is why I call it a gift. So maybe I, if you could change your perspective. Yeah. And, 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 well, my perspective is continually changing on this journey. But I met a beekeeper a couple weeks ago at a local beekeeping association meeting, and he must be in his 80s. And he says, I, I sting myself all the time. I eat propolis all the time. I've never gotten a flu shot. I've never gotten sick. 
never get a cold, feel great. <laughs> I eat honey almost every day. I I take propolis tincture at the first signs of being sick with an elderberry syrup that's mm -hmm. got uh, honey in it as well. I have not been sick in years. What is the bee scene like in Berlin? It's big. Yeah. There are there are a lot of beekeepers. And and it's funny that you should ask that because one of my projects is researching the scene here in Berlin because in March I'll be speaking at a conference about urban beekeeping and my topic is Berlin. Cool. And and they asked me and I had done a presentation, I guess it was last last year or this year. Maybe it was this year. Um, in uh, Valencia, in Spain, for another urban beekeeping uh, conference. And I was talking about New York. And they're like, yeah, you could just do New York again. I'm like, that's boring. <laughs> you know, like, I don't want to do the same presentation again. Yeah. So I'm going to do this whole canvas of the beekeeping scene here in Berlin. Um, it's interesting. There are 16 different neighborhood configured beekeeping associations that more or less are under an umbrella, which is the BID, which I don't know what it stands for, Berlin Imkerei. It's basically the Berlin Beekeepers Association. Mm -hmm. And then they have these ch local chapters by neighborhood. And then you have more of the ideological associations, like the one that I'm affiliated with, which is Meli Farah, which is all natural beekeeping. And then you have a kind of offshoot from there. One of the students launched something called Stadt Bienen, which is basically city bees. And they do natural beekeeping, but they use a different style. And they've gone, I would say, kind of entrepreneurial in that I think they're in 16 different cities at this point. They offer training courses 60 a year. Wow. I mean, they're really doing beekeeping as a, an entity as opposed to just some hobby that, you know, they do two courses a year. No, this is like a full on enterprise. And let's see, there are beehives all over the city. You just, you'll find them in a cemetery or in the schoolyard of a, or in the yard of a school and you just stumble upon them. Bees aren't really mainstream enough here in the U.S for people to have a level of comfort with them where they could be like, yeah, our school has beehives or, or we'll put beehives in a cemetery, which by the way, I think is a really incredible gesture. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because when I was in Spain, I was doing a lot of research in the EU and I could be a little off with my numbers, but Spain has 2.7 million hives, the most in one country in the EU, which is just about equivalent, if not a little bit more, than the entire United States. I find that incredible. <laughs> <laughs> and then, if I'm not mistaken, I think that there were something like 80,000 beekeepers in Spain, but Germany has like 130,000 beekeepers. Wow. But the majority of them are hobbyists and they have you know fewer hives. Mm. So I think that beekeeping, I mean, has been a tradition here forever for for so long and you know when dry i drove from barcelona to bulgaria one summer and going through the balkans we were going through slovenia croatia bosnia and serbia through the back roads you see basically tables or stands in people's backyards or front yards rather with jars of honey and either a collection jar based on the honor program or two octanarians? No, what are they called? 80 year olds <laughs> in, their, in their lawn chair, octogenarians. Octogenarians. Oct octogenarians? Yeah. yeah. You have like these old people sitting in lawn chairs just by the roadside selling honey. And it's so refreshing to see. And you see the hives in the backyards and through the woods, and they're just everywhere. And there's just that culture. And, and it's interesting because the history of you know, honey is that it used to be everywhere. People had it for a sweetener. And then sugar became cheap and affordable and imported from 
you know, the the uh, Virgin Islands and the the what do they call it? The Antilles, uh, the Dutch Dutch trading companies. And once they started importing that, and the prices started dropping, it became really cheap to have sugar. And then the hobbyist beekeepers stopped keeping hives. And then it became the big industry that we know now. What are some of the hives that people are using? It's funny that you ask this because I was talking with Mikhail Thiele yesterday and he said what kind of hive he had. And I thought to myself, write that down. That's what it's called in German. And I need to know what it's called in German. And I don't know the word because I don't speak German. But um, <laughs> Langstroth are here in wood, in styrofoam, in plastic. I've seen all of them. Mm -hmm. You have not too many top bars or Kenyan styled top bars. However, there's uh bean kista i think is what it's called and that's in that style in that it's horizontal mm -hmm. but you do have frames but they're really tall frames oh it's kind of like a dadant or like a yeah. it's not quite a double deep but maybe let's say it's a deep plus a medium yeah and they don't add supers you can you can partition it with a solid board and then open that up as they are collecting more and more nectar during the, the flow. Um, there are log hives and I work, well, when we were doing the conference, the emphasis was on tree beekeeping mm -hmm. and we did a two day workshop building log hives. So I'm getting more and more into that. Uh, so I, I've seen in their apiaries, these log hives and it's becoming i think more and more popular throughout central and kind of western europe uh, slowly spreading out and in spain for instance in portugal they have cork hives where they oh. basically skin the cork bark off and then it wraps itself around and they do these huge staples to close it they drill a hole in they put a cap of bark on and they just kind of place it wherever. Uh, I don't, I don't, I think it's open at the bottom. I think some of them are open on the bottom. So it acts kind of like a skep mm -hmm. in that you're destroying part of the hive if you're going to be doing any kind of har harvesting of the honey. Uh, and those are very traditional. And then you have things like in Slovenia, which I don't even know how to describe it. it, it it's more of a B structure. Yes. It, you, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. It's, I, I, I call it kind of like a hut that has, let's say, five or 50 hives in rows, and each of them has a different uh, face, painted like face plate. And that's a whole tradition, especially in Slovenia, where they're all designed and painted and have different scenes of, you know, religious scenes or nature scenes or irreverent scenes. <laughs> and, you know, so this is painted in different colors so, and patterns so that the bees can identify it as their own. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then some of them are used for epitherapeutic purposes where they have the, the air the masks yeah. uh, connected with breathing the air. What do you think about have, that? I think it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I I haven't done it yet. What and, are, what are um, the, the claimed benefits of breathing in hive air? I mean, I would totally do it if it were an option. <laughs> I'm no authority, but I know that they do it for uh, anxiety, uh -huh. asthma. Oh. I'm not sure if it's done for things like arthritis and rheumatism, but I know that that's obviously the, the bee venom therapy. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I think that if you talk to a, a certified apotherapist, yeah. they, would, they would know much better. But I know that also they have bee beds where you can sleep on or rest on top of the vibration, and that gives you some kind of energetic field of joy or <laughs> medicine i don't know um and all of it's fascinating i, I just joined a, a whatsapp and a, a google listserv from dr stefan stangachu 
from Romania. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm blown away by all the different applications of things coming from the hive. You know, not just the obvious ones like the, the purplus and the, the venom, but treatments for cancer and leukemia and diabetes. And if somebody's pregnant, this, that, and the other thing. And that's yeah, super exciting. So where else does our conversation take us? Yeah, let's talk about the Learning from the Bees conference. You were like the central hub of logistics and planning for that. I think my official title was lead producer. <laughs> um, and wow, what a journey. Uh, I had attended the first conference outside of Amsterdam, which was three, four days of 350 like-minded natural beekeepers or bee lovers coming together and from seven o'clock in the morning until 11 o'clock at night, just being in the beeness. <laughs> there were scientists and artists and activists and conservationists and lawyers and just people doing amazing things. It was so moving. It was so transformative, uh, super moving experience. And I didn't know how prophetic it would be, but at the end, I went up to one of the organizers and I said, thank you so much. This has been really powerful. And if there's anything that I can do, I'd love to be involved in the next one. And unbeknownst to me at that point, they had kind of gone through hell to make it happen. Wow. And I think that they were probably thinking to themselves, <laughs> this ain't going to happen. <laughs> and then meanwhile, riding that high, uh, I had come to Berlin for six months. And prior to arriving, I had done a little research to meet some beekeepers locally, which introduced me to Heinz Rusa, who is one of the founders of the local Mellifera chapter, the Natural Beekeeping Association. And I went to one of their monthly meetings. Uh, I asked to sit next to somebody who could help me translate because it was conducted in German. And the woman who was his girlfriend translated for me. And one portion of it was, we want to do a tree beekeeping, which is called Zeidler, Zeidlerei in, uh, in German, do a Zeidlerei workshop. And Tom Seeley said that he'll come. And if he's going to be coming to Berlin, it makes sense for us to build some kind of conference around this. And I said, oh, Tom Seely <laughs> conference, <laughs> beekeeping, Berlin, I'm in. And I was looking for projects and other things to keep me connected to the bees and busy while I was in Berlin. And it just grew into this enormous undertaking. It ended up being four days, two days being the workshop for uh, almost 40 people where they learned about the handicraft of tree beekeeping from Poland and Russia and Germany. And they built something like 20 log hives, which the outcome of which I can tell you about is a citizen science project, which I'm super excited about. And then we did this two day conference that had 36 speakers in like six different parallel sessions, three panel discussions, all, all sorts of um, audience participation activities. We had an offsite dinner slash garden slash apiary tour with a preview screening of Honeyland, oh, the documentary. Wow. I mean, it, it, we had an art exhibition, displays of artifacts of tree beekeeping and antique kind of beekeeping equipment, book signings. It was awesome. How was many awesome. people attended? We think about 250. Wow. And these and are people coming from all over the globe. 26 countries. <laughs> we had somebody from Brazil, Palestine and Israel, Turkey, all of Europe, US, Canada, yeah, we were really happy. And I didn't experience much of it because <laughs> I was still running around <laughs> producing it. 
but I had my kind of integration moment the Monday afterwards when a group of us got together in one of the gardens and did kind of a decompress integrate session. And at one point we were all in a circle talking about our experience that day, that morning in the garden, as well as the conference itself. And two of the nine people said that it will change your life. And I, I almost cried. <laughs> I mean, like to, to experience what they had created the year before and then one year to the day later to realize it, me personally with my team was really emotional and, and, and That's really the, gratifying. It's the highest compliment. Yeah. For sure. I mean, we had an amazing scientist, uh, Czemek Norowski from Poland. He works at the WWF. He came up to me at one point and said, thank you. I never thought that I would meet Tom Seeley in person, have an audience with him, share my research, have him express interest. And now we're talking about collaborating. He's like, I never thought that this would happen in my lifetime. And I mean, my heart just like leapt out and I just, that's why we did it. It was to connect, connect beekeepers, spread natural beekeeping and, and really kind of work towards reimagining what the future for the bees could be. So that was our, our mission. I think we succeeded. And yeah, now so. looking ahead at the Learning from the Bees Conference 2020. <laughs> I'm not going to be involved in that. Oh. <laughs> I, I, need, I need my break. Yeah. My break. Yeah. Actually, it's going, to, it's going to revert back to the people from the Natural Beekeeping Trust who founded the conference series. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to be doing it in England. And if I'm not mistaken, it will be a smaller group of people. And I don't have many details as to what it's going to be. Okay. Um, but one of the, the outcomes of our project is uh, the intention to form an international coalition uh, to collect citizen science data on wild honeybees. I think that's so important. My, my perspective, and I could be totally wrong, but my perspective is that a lot of the data that is being used for understanding the problems that honeybees are facing and, and forging solutions, a lot of the data is coming from migratory beekeepers or operations where they have thousands and thousands of hives and like here locally i try to encourage hobbyists to participate in as many citizen science you know surveys or, or like the bee informed partnership sentinel apiary program things like that because we have such a big stake in this too information that we can provide is just as important. It's important for different reasons, but it still is important for us to be using our voices and giving that, giving this information that can be used to really look at the entire picture. Absolutely. And speaking of the entire picture, I mean, one of the reasons why we endeavor to do this is because we don't think the entire picture is being scientifically recorded. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of these studies, like you say, are from the, the large scale uh, operations or studies that are done in laboratories. You have people like Tom Seeley that actually have done the research of bees in the wild, but he has like 11 hives. And what we would like to do is create something where you get hundreds, if not thousands of hives in nature. Or, you know, we, we have to define what the protocol is, mm -hmm. but, you know, quote unquote, wild honeybees, I think we're going to define for our particular study, at least, are bees living in natural tree cavities. Additionally, cavities that have been carved out of trees by men and women, uh, but you know the, the, the tree beekeeping that is centuries old uh, uh, practice in specifically Central Europe and, and Russia, but it's spreading. And then bees in log, log hives. Mm -hmm. Because I think that, you know, as Torben Schiffer and others say, the bees in boxes, it's purely for beekeepers. It's, it has nothing to do, it's, as he says, it's, it's not species appropriate. Yeah. You know, yeah. They need 
a thickness of walls of four inches minimum. I mean, they were living in trees for what, 30 million years? And they've been living in boxes for what, two, 300 years maximum? No, not even. I mean, Langstroth devel developed it in 1851. And, you know, maybe they were making other different types of boxes maximum 100 years before. But, you know, otherwise they were in skeps, which were a little thicker. Or, um, and so they don't have proper insulation. They don't have the proper kind of moisture retention or absorption. Yeah. They don't have what they need. They don't have this microcosm of debris underneath in which you have the book scorpions or you have the other mites or you have other organisms that are living. Right. And how can we ask this. how can we ask the bees to genetically adapt to their threats when they're in environments that aren't premium? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Like, how can I train for a marathon and run a marathon if I'm eating French fries every day? Exactly. I can't. <laughs> That's the point. Yeah. Exactly. The irony here is the more and more I learn about natural or Darwinian or whatever you want to call it, beekeeping, bee-centric beekeeping, the less I want to keep bees because I just feel like modern practices are not really thinking about the bees. It's, it's about us. It's about what's convenient for us, what's productive for honey mm -hmm. production, what's, you know, you know, migratory beekeeping. I mean, don't even get me started. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it's interesting. I tried to get one of the speakers who is a commercial beekeeper, but he's what we call extensive. So opposite of intensive. And he has something like 10,000 hives but no more than 60 in any single location. Wow. So really minimizing the numbers uh, clustered together. He, do, he, if he treats, he only uses organic um, uh, materials mm -hmm. like oxalic acid or formic acid, T-mol, things like that. And then he, he has other practices. Like I think he does like one honey harvest uh, in the season uh, and, and others, but unfortunately he had a conflict of scheduling, couldn't attend our conference, but I would love to show conventional beekeepers that there is this happy medium. You can be more natural. You can be, you know, less, uh, invasive. You can be less intensive in your operation and still live off. Can I just talk very briefly about the, the Ambisadors? Yes, of course. But yeah, we, we started the Ambisadors about a year ago, and it's a, it's a collective slash consultancy with the mission of basically connecting the bee community and also reaching the public and spreading awareness of and appreciation for the importance of bees and other pollinators as well uh, through events such as the honey festivals or conferences, smaller events like honey tastings for the general public. Uh, I've done cooking with honey classes. Uh, I go to schools um, and teach kids and do workshops like building little bee hotels or rolling candles out of foundation, uh, building seed bombs. And the mission is basically, you know, both local and kind of global. And if there's a way that we can connect and, you know, one thing that I've observed having lived now in three different cities and traveling and talking with beekeepers all over mainly Europe, uh, a little bit in Africa, there are these petty rivalries that I've been witnessing here and there and all over that are based on maybe personality and ego, maybe ideology of, you know, I'm organic or I'm commercial and, and, and the practices. And for me, I need to stay neutral yeah. and connect because if we can unite around this thing that we, this being that we love to be, set aside our differences and come together and focus our energy on helping the bee, we could be a more powerful force and we could have a singular voice. I, I mean, I know that that's never going to happen, but. I mean, I don't want to be part of an argument. I want to be part of a solution. And like one of the reasons why I have this podcast platform is to 
highlight the voices of different perspectives in a way that's diplomatic, informative, but not pointing fingers and not saying like, you're wrong and you're wrong because you're not doing this. Totally. And, and, and that's what we said at the conference. There's no us versus them. This is we're all at the table together, joining hands and, you know, digging in our heels and, and looking at a problem of failing systems across apiculture, agriculture, forestry, etc. And, you know, we're almost at game over. <laughs> like the climate is, or the, the planet is is collapsing or imploding. And if we don't do something by humans, and you know, maybe that's not a bad thing. <laughs> we are kind of cancer <laughs> on the planet. But like the fact that we're taking all these species with us, it's it's horrible. So anyway, what we strive to do is make action connect and educate. So if somebody if somebody listening to the show today feels a spark of interest in the work that the ambassadors are doing, is this something that somebody from Galveston, Texas can sign up to become an ambassador to to do the work locally or how is this something that people can join or can people just draw inspiration from the work that you're doing and model it in their own communities? Well, People all over the world can sign up. We have all of our social media channels at Ambizadors. It's spelled, well, you'll have, probably have it in the- I'll, I'll put a link to it on my website. Great. But we have Instagram and Facebook and a mailing list. But the idea is that as we build our different, uh, you know, as we build the, the collective and have more and more projects, more and more people can get involved. And there are some projects that we're working on that could be distributed, kind of like kits. And, you know, people can implement these kits locally. And that would be a way to spread, for instance, natural beekeeping or, um, you know, things that you can do for increasing forage for bees or things that could be useful for native bees in your local area, et cetera. I think that... You know, community outreach and education is such a meaningful way to use your beekeeping for good. For sure. And it's easier than people might realize to participate and and to get out there and talk about bees because I tell you what, like I've, community services has always been a part of my beekeeping journey. Bees are in mainstream right now. So Mm -hmm. if we don't capitalize on it, before let's say this fad fades i i think now is the time yeah and, and people are fascinated i mean bees are fascinating <laughs> <laughs> like i i mean i've been i'm i'm going into what eight nine years now uh, i just i can't get enough and laura b from the college of the melissa i mean she's part and parcel of this fascination because her schooling is about you know kind of a six pronged approach it's not just the science but it's also the medicine and the mythology and the the sacredness and you know like every ancient culture had a connection to the bees I mean, everyone she's amazing i yeah. we're, we're actually collaborating on an apitourism trip to greece in october of 2020 oh to follow in the footsteps of artemis that's and cool it's, it's gonna wow. be amazing it's going to be like visiting the ancestors. It's going to be incredible. Yeah. To learn more about Steve, you can find him online at ambisadors.com. I'll also include links to his website and social media accounts at beekeeperconfidential.com. Do you want to know a little surprise? You can meet me and Steve together in one place at the Honey Love Natural Beekeeping Conference which takes place January 18th and 19th at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. We will both be there along with our friends Mikhail Tile, Michael Bush, Sam Comfort, Les Crowder, just to name a few. You can find tickets to that event at honeylove.org forward slash NBC. Until next time, may the buzz be with you.
Beekeeper Confidential is a Waggle Works production and is written and produced by Mandy Shaw.